Hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 203, Dos Zero Tres. Hope you guys are feeling good and you're feeling fine and fresh and dandy. It's now Tuesday. You're slowly but surely you're slowly but surely approaching the middle of the week where you, you know, living for the weekend, mofos can celebrate that you've gained an extra two days of rest and relaxation from your sorry existence. Right? That's what you can do. But yeah, apart from that, I hope you guys are doing good. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling amazing. I'm feeling optimistic about the future. I'm in a good place right now. I'm reading a lot. I'm working out. I'm trying to keep my mind focused on the things that mattered. And I'm slowly but surely trying to stem, stop myself from getting too excited about Friday Junction 2 Festival at Boston Manor Park. I'm really excited, man. I'm really excited. I'm really looking forward to it. Again, I don't want to get too excited because... The last UK festival, that, or the last London festival I went to was Love Box, and that was a bit of a shit show. Apart from seeing DJ Harvey, that was great. Just the overall ambience, the, you know, the naffness of the crowd, uh, low volume, the dust everywhere from all the mud, everyone. Not dust, but all the, like, you know, it was dry, it was really hot that day, so I guess the, the, the park had kind of dried up. People were shuffling all over the place. I think that's when shuffling first started. Oh, shuffling was coming into prominence or becoming the trendy dance of the dance floor. So, you know, there's all this dust, mud particles flying all over the air. I ended up with, you know, my boots covered in absolute soot, which my, which my, which was my mistake really, in it, going to uh, a London festival wearing white boots. So I put that on myself and just generally it wasn't a really good crowd. It was just a bit of, bit of a poor experience but obviously i did enjoy seeing dj harvey play right i think that was my first time seeing him play live after following him for the best part of a decade and yeah it was a great experience i then went to go i then went to follow him at the Berghain, so that was great you know what i mean I, I've, I've done some i've seen him in some cool places but the overall experience was a bit naff i was thinking why right, imagine imagine looking forward to this your whole your whole weekend your whole summer kind of a lot of people do right a lot of people aren't as fortunate as I am to go to Barcelona and go to see a festival. Some people don't want to go to Barcelona. And some people just, you know, they could, that's what they like. They like to go to festivals in London. So imagine gearing up your whole, you know, going through that terrible winter that we had, right? Where it drags and drags and drags. And then, you know, making do, you know, uh, getting over the hill of the early couple of months of the year, right? Between January and March, it's always a bit dead. And then finally you get to festival season and you get there and it's like, you know, poor organization, like we saw We Are Festival, people being crushed by the, you know, better security fences and all that sort of shit. It's low noise that we saw at all points east and just terrible, you know, overall experience with the people that go there. That's something that's worrying me a little bit. Because, you know, as you guys are aware as well, electronic music or techno in general has become the popular music of choice in most festivals. Or for most people that do attend festivals, they don't they, they like going to these kind of things like Deck Mantle, Output, um, loads of other festivals that go on that kind of have the same similar sort of uh, lineup. So it's going to be difficult to see, to gauge what kind of crowd is going to be there. But I'm hoping it's not going to be poor. Hoping it's going to be a good ambience. Hoping the usually crowds are dictated, I think, in London. Usually crowds are dictated a lot by the people who they book. If they book a certain amount of people, like, I'm pretty sure Saturday's crowd will be worse than Friday's crowd just because of Major Plex, right? I would imagine Major Plex fans will be a little bit... I like Major Plex, right? He's a great DJ. I'm a big fan of his. I think he has maybe... He's, uh, his boiler room is maybe up there with maybe the top five boiler rooms of all time, right? That one in Berlin, like, fucking stunning. Stunning DJ, right? Great productions. Um, and all these... Mo I, love all, I love all these aliases, right? He's great. Great dude. Um, the drama he went through with Nino Kravis back in the day was also super, super funny. Um, and he backpedaled that one quickly, didn't he? Um, but yeah, I'd assume that... I'd also assume maybe some of the bicep crew crowd might be a little bit questionable, right? I, I don't know. I have a feeling that the people that go see bicep... At print works won't be the kind of person people that I'd want to go see, I'd want to hang out with. But again, maybe I'm being a little bit of a dick in that way, and I think everyone's going to be proper cool. I'm hoping so. Um, let's let's check it again, Lionel, because I've I've been on the website like two million times. I think in this whole week, I, I love to see what the history is looking like. But so Friday, yeah, like I said, I, I'm always a, I always think when it comes to London festivals or festivals in general, anyway, um, mostly to do with the lineup that really dictates the crowd. The lineup mostly, and then sometimes the way the 
it's been marketed the event itself right we are festival you knew it was gonna be a shit show for the moment zero you know they were doing that thing that when the festival does that thing where they say oh 99 percent of tickets are sold out grab them now before they're gone they haven't sold out 99 percent of tickets they're probably not even, they're, they're, they're probably just just about sold over half right so when they continue to keep doing that and keep extending the deadline of a pre-sale all that kind of stuff you know it's going to be a shitty crowd right so too much communication sometimes it can be shitty and also line up so the only thing that i'm worried about for the friday is probably bicep i'd assume bicep crowd would be a bit weird giles peterson and daphne you know you're going to get chin strokers there so that's going to be cool no problem with that one ricardo ricardo Lobos and craig richard's going to be stellar uh two fabric alumni uh D dixon and dj cos would be great cos has probably had one of the biggest productions of the last year right would we'll pick it up right I'll pick up the phone. Is it pick up the phone? I'll pick it up the phone. Pick up the phone. Is it pick up the phone or pick up? What is it? What's that track by DJ Cos? Pick up the phone or pick up? Uh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, yeah, so that, I think the, the bridge stage will be pretty cool. I think the crowd will be pretty nice there. The Fonica stage with Honey, Motor City, Drum Ensemble will be pretty fine too. I have a, I have a strong feeling Saturday's going to be where the wankers are. 100%. Major Plex, Tale of Us, um, Adam Bayer, uh, Richie Horton, uh, Loco Dice, yeah, hundred percent. All the all the Muppets are gonna come out uh, on Saturday. Emily Lenz, Dax J, who's another one I've been wanting to see for a while. They always talk about Dax J on, on on Reddit on the Techno subreddit. It's always funny to see the people who a lot of people speak about in the same sort of sense in certain communities, right? Uh, I don't know the hip hop subreddit. Um, you loves to talk about Lou Uzi Vert. Um, loves to talk about um, what's his face? Uh, Joey ba Joey Badass, Schoolboy Q. They've got their favourites, and I think uh, the techno subreddit, they love talking about Amelie Lenz, Charlotte DeWitt, obviously. Um, uh, not much on Peggy, and um, loads on Dax J. Dax J is super popular on that techno subreddit. So if anyone from this team wants to maybe, you know, um, gain some customer insight about what people want to see from him or to kind of leak some tunes, I definitely recommend they check out that techno subreddit because there's a lot of people on there that really love that dude. Um, so yeah, I'd imagine Saturday's going to be all the wankers are going to come out. But again... I, I'm not bothered. I, I really have to say the only thing that I want to see is just a good organize. It's just great organization. I want to. I want the entry to be flaw flawless. I want the whole ticket. I want the whole bar situation to be fairly manageable. I'm not expecting it to be you know tens of thousands of bars everywhere because it's a pretty small site. I just want it to be an easy system, and I think it will be because it's tokens, right? So I think that the flow of the bar should be pretty um, easy for the most part because you're not getting any change. You know, handing over some tokens to get some drinks. Um, and then the, the most important thing for me is going to be the sound, the most important thing, because I know usually the count, local councils are a bit finicky with who they allow or how loud they allow the sound to go up in particular areas and what it may, what may it be. So I'm hoping this time around it's a bit different and they change it and it's not shitty and they're able to kind of crank it up a little bit um, because if not, it's going to be make for a really, really shitty festival experience, I think, for the most part. I'm hoping I'm wrong, hoping I'm wrong, but, you know, I've been to too many London festivals to know that sometimes the sound can really, really be, um, you know, near, nigh on, you know, unenjoyable, really, from how low it is. But, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it, man. I can't wait. Have they got any new material bits on their YouTube that I should know about here? Um I've been again. I've been on this channel. I've been on this channel. I think too, way, way, way too often. As you can see from all the red bars, all the stuff that I've watched over the last couple of weeks. But yeah, I can't wait for this festival to start and kick off, and to have a good time when I get there, man. It's gonna be fun, man. It's gonna be fun. Is there anything on there that I should know about? Ba, 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 ba. Any new videos from Junction? I don't think so. Really, I don't know. I don't think there's any new videos here from Junction. Anything that's going on that we should be aware of. Some great pictures, obviously, from the crowd last year. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, wow. Wait, they got this. This is a cool little video, isn't it? This weekend. That should be cool, man. Looking forward to, looking forward to, looking forward to. It hasn't sold out, which I I don't know if that's a concern for the organizer. I'm not sure if they again how much money goes into making some of these festivals and putting these kind of productions together. I really I did listen to an interview with um, the Crank Brothers the other day. Actually, on is the Crank Brothers that do Junction too? I'm pretty sure the Crank Brothers, isn't it? Who organizes? Who's the or who's the uh, Junction Two founders? Who is it? Is it the Crank Brothers, or is it, did they do the thing that I was? Huh. I don't know. I don't know who actually does the the uh who actually makes it. 
I don't know. One of the most well known returns. Okay. Maybe it's maybe it's a London Warehouse um Right, London Warehouse, whatever events, right? Maybe it's them. Anyway, doesn't really matter. Uh about to blow. Two parties about to blow. Five, top five all time parties at yeah, Junction Two. Okay. I think it might be I think it I think it might be um, the LW crew, right? I think so. I think it's them. I'm pretty sure. Right? Anyway, doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter. Let's move on, man. There's so much to talk about. So much that I want to talk about with you guys. And here we go. So, um, topics, 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 topics. Number one, Supreme and Raiders 2019 collection. Well, talking about being fluid, talking about being like water, like Eric Benetti mentioned in an interview that I'm going to read to you later. Um, this is another example of that kind of fluidity that's allowed Supreme to be remain the number one streetwear brand in the world. Now, this collection, is it anything to write home about? This little uh, capture collection with the Raiders? Probably not. Will, will most ca kids care about it? Probably yes, because there's no reason. Supreme stuff has retail value, so they're always going to care about it. But again, just another clear indication of just how well positioned Supreme are that they can put out these, on the face of it, quite naff capsule collections that have been done to death. A bit tired of seeing the Raiders iconography or logo anywhere. No one really gives a shit for the most part culturally about it. I think in the same way they did in the past, but it's got that cachet, that cool cachet that kids like. Um, and again, I think if I was if I was the age of these kids that are featured in this lookbook, or if I was 16, 15, and I saw this come out, I'd be all over it, all over. Especially when you just get your introduction to hip hop, you start listening to Wu Tang. Sorry, you start listening to Wu Tang Clan. You start listening to stuff from the East, from the West Coast. Um, you start just to get involved with music and pick collecting vinyl, and maybe DJing, maybe going to events. You start just to kind of come around. You might have an older person. You might, there might be a couple of older people in your crew, some older brothers who kind of put you on, and this stuff, this stuff kind of starts to marry, starts to make relevance, or not even that. Just you know, browsing on Instagram. You stumble across your favorite artist or celebrity of choice and they're wearing these clothing pieces and you're like, shit, I need that too. So I get what they're doing. 100% get it. Now for me, is it for me? Probably not. Would I wear it? No. Well, do they care about my opinion? No way, shape or form. But what I do like is a lookbook. I like the the free, the 35 millimeter film photography for the lookbook. I like how casual it is. I like that the fact that they've 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 switched between uh, using the kids from the kids in for the States for some stuff for some of the lookbook uh, pieces and also the kids from the crew in paris some of the london people i like how they flip around i'm not sure if it's to do with the fact that they want to have uh, european kids wearing specifically american iconography kind of design-led influence pieces in order to kind of grab that european market right because i'd imagine raiders doesn't have the same collect kind of connotation they would do in the states right people wouldn't really give a shit about it as much as they would do in the states so maybe it's a good way to kind of get that kind of market or it's just a great way to kind of you know uh get that kind of parisian side of it the european side interested or kind of you know get them involved with the whole supreme brand overall they are involved anyway if you look at if you look at how um, they how they kind of you know communicate with the uh, with the other stores, you see some people from the states going over and checking them out and stuff, and visiting and showing them around and stuff. And it seems like from the outside looking in, the Paris store has a very particular kind of vibe. The people that work there are particular kind of people. They're very native to the actual city. Um, they tapped into a local skate crew or skate community there, which I think is also a genius move on Supreme's part. So yeah, just generally just aced it out of the window, aced it out of the park, sorry. And yeah, the lookbook looks great. Um, the kids wearing it look awesome. Again, if I was that age, I'd be all over this collection. But I think at this point in my life, I think wearing Supreme uh, branded items, especially with the Raiders logos, is probably a bit naff in my in my place in life. But again, I like the I like the lookbook. I think it looks fucking awesome. Really great pictures. Um, well done. Have you noticed as well lately within the last few or so Supreme uh, drops or Supreme um, previews for their footwear collaborations? Most of the shoes are worn. Have you noticed that? And I, I, I've seen it now being filtrated through to other brands. Other brands are now adopting that same thing, which I like because I always and I, I've always hated when you saw lookbooks and you saw lookbooks of clothing where the the, the, the shirts hadn't been steamed or iron or anything or whatever. They still had the fold lines in and just plucked it out of the paint out of the plastic like. Make it look worn, like make it look like it's natural, like it's it feels comfortable. And it's not just some stiffing. It just just got printed 
today like give it some kind of i don't know let it live a little bit I, that's what i never liked i think as well sometimes with those pictures that you see on hype beats of people wearing some version of a you know an air max or some sort of other nondescript retro and they've always got the fucking funky color sock on the pin rolls they're always standing on their tiptoes like it's always that annoying fucking pose they look like they're running but they're not you know you damn well know sneakerheads on run so they always do that weird kind of pose it really annoys me it's always like focused in on the feet it's never taken into context where they are it's all just like kind of sterile environments and the shoes just look too shiny right i just don't like it's too too shiny for me i'm not telling you to go play you know fucking five-a-side football and then take a picture of them but at least make them look a little bit you know, war a little bit real, a little bit warmer, and I like the fact that Supreme sizes do that themselves. But yeah, uh, back to this collection. Um, you have t-shirts, polos. This polo is pretty nice. Oh, is that a polo? Oh, it's a button actually. It's not even a polo. Oh, that's quite nice actually. I quite like the button down. The button down is quite nice. Uh, it comes with a matching short set. Again, I, I look like an absolute wanker wearing this. I think at this age, but again, if I was younger, this would be right up my alley. The hoodie's fairly cool, fairly um, innocent for the most part. You know, you got the Raiders logo on the back, Supreme um, written on the front. Of course, you've got to have that because if you don't have Supreme on the front, who's going to know you're wearing Supreme? The black's obviously the stellar colorway in that. Actually, you know what? I wouldn't mind actually the white, the white one. I can, I can imagine seeing someone like an Alex also wearing the white one and making it look quite swaggy. Eh? The t-shirt looks quite nice as well. I like the hat. Of course, the hat is fucking great. The hat's interesting, isn't it? It looks like it's a bit flimsy on the front. I wonder what that's about. Is that the way it's cut, or it's like a vintage shape? I don't know. Can you see that? The hat there in the front looks a little bit shrunk, a little bit shrink. It, it reminds me a little bit. No, not. To, it reminds me a little bit of an eight. Is that because it's an eight bill cap? That's why it's a bit. I don't know. I think the fit of that would be quite interesting to see how that looks like in, in IRL. But yeah, again, great collection as per usual from Supreme. Raiders, Raiders collaboration. I'm pretty sure it's going to come out this Thursday, right? That's why they always previewing that. Yeah, we should do a good job of the, of of announcing stuff when it's just about to come out too it's like you know apple's sort of done that too right whenever they have a uh whenever they're displaying some new technology on one of their shows it's, it's, it's always a kind of a precursor to it coming out quite soon they don't really waste time in between you know just promote stuff for the sake of it they'll just they always tell you a timeline of when stuff's going to come um so that's pretty cool i like that next tab we have the don c drops a new colorway for the jordan legacy 312 now i don't know what jordan legacy 312 is i have no interest in the actual model but i like the colorway um, um and i, I kind of like what don c does colorway choices anyway overall again it's not for me i think his shoes are a little bit too sneakery they're probably in the mold of somebody that likes to look it kind of matches his fashion right very um urban luxe right um so loads of bright colors rich materials and a real focus on quality of craftsmanship and then kind of you know bedazzlements and all that sort of malarkey so maybe not my vibe right i'm not going to wear those just on hats and stuff with the leather straps which i'm sure he's probably made like i would i would love to i would love to know how much he's made of those hats like it'd be not pocket watching but i bet he's made a lot of those fucking hats remember they were everywhere at one point right the ones with the with the sort of like a snakeskin brim and stuff and he's now kind of gone into making other bits and pieces like shorts and vests and stuff like really taking you know standard uh courtroom or court floor is it called court floor right court floor apparel in terms of basketball jerseys and shorts and really elevating them right it's sort of like um it's sort of like a contemporary play on uh basketball jerseys when they used to get worn in hip-hop do you remember that was a big thing right everyone was wearing jerseys right throwback jerseys so it's sort of like taking that kind of moniker where people were getting you know paying you know crazy amounts of money for jerseys and he's really elevated it to a kind of luxury feel and i guess these shoes are an, an, a, a kind of extension of that this colorway is, is something i'd be a fan of it's very reminiscent of like a 90s uh tech runner or even an 80s tennis shoe for that like mark like an agassi on old school um you know uh it also called Air Trainer One. I like the different elements of it. I like the mix of the Jordan Free heel tab. I like the mix of the kind of, you know, the tra Air Trainer One's front strap at the front. I like the cement. Um, I like where the bubble placement is, or the assets. It's a nice shoe, to be honest. I quite like it. Um, again, I'm not familiar with the model, the Legacy 312. I'm not sure what that has to do with the overall, where, where that is placed in the actual overall Jordan brand, whether or not that's just a thing of like, you know, Jordan finally bringing in somebody from Kanye's crew to kind of design it which is ironic you know considering um, Kanye said that lyric about Yeezy jumping over the jump man and you know uh, Nike not wanting to give Kanye the same contract that they give athletes because he's not an athlete right right because he's a whatever and now they've suddenly you know gone they've gone they've kind of doubled back and they've hired basically all of, of Kanye's sort of like um you know 
kids or proteges in the shape of a Heron Preston, a Virgil, a Matthew Williams. They've all got shoes, right? They've all got kind of collections based around their brands and their personas and stuff. And Kanye couldn't get, couldn't even get an athlete's collaboration with him. And I look what he's done. But I think it's worked out in the whole overall pretty well. I think probably the people we I mentioned previously are probably more adept at working underneath uh, a Nike structure than maybe a Kanye would. You probably just can't work under that no i wouldn't say restraints but you know working within some kind of level of restraints i think these guys probably are better at playing the game than kanye so that probably what results in this overall sure but I, I quite like it man i like it i know some people in the comments didn't like it look at the hypebeast comments but you know hypebeast comments people don't like many things but i like I quite like the shoe and again for someone with a wide foot like myself i think this jordan legacy 312 would probably be a good fit again would i wear it too often probably not so it's gonna be a shoe you buy it's like a footscape right you have the the sole intention of wearing that footscape you like how it looks you saw a picture of some small japanese kid somewhere wearing wearing footscape to make him look fucking insane right dripping drip was insane and you you try and put you try and swag them with your fucking unico jeans and all of a sudden it doesn't look quite it doesn't hit the same right and you wonder why <laughs> number one you're not five foot two number two you're not wearing 700 quid denim and number three you just don't look good on sizes you know seven and above maybe i'd say right and also footscapes have that weird thing where they only look good when you look down on them as soon as you look for the side they just look like trash is it me i don't know i just don't like the way they look on for the side they look weird uh but yeah jordan legacy 312 I'm a, I'm a fan of it i like the shoe uh check it out when's it due to come out it's due to come out on the first so it's out today it should be out it was out yesterday so yeah check it 130 dollars though Oof. it's a lot in it for that kind of shoe 130 i'd pay maybe me i'd pay maximum a one or 90 quid but not 130 shades i didn't know it was that much but i guess because it's got the don c cosine in it does it have don't is it even a don c shoe yeah it is it's just a, a Jordan legacy 312 there's no there's no because i'd imagine if you're that kind of sneaker person you'd want some clear labeling that it was a don oh yeah it, is. it says it here on the tongue on the sorry on the on the tongue there okay cool that might make it worth it, right? <laughs> that little label there. It's sad I'm saying it, but honestly, it's the truth. Some singers will think that it's like, why would you want to wear a collaboration shoe if it doesn't look like a collaboration shoe, right? You want something to say it looks like a collaboration shoe. Um, but yeah, check that out. It's available now. Um, next on the list, we actually have another um, Air Trainer one, uh, or a shoe with a strap, basically. Uh, do you remember I mentioned Polar? Um, it's coming back. Well, Polo has come back, and Eric Costner is debuting a Polo Skate Co. Nike S Nike SB Air Trainer One. Right? Interesting because um, Nike SB tried to bring the Air Trainer into this SB family. It didn't quite work out when they brought their Air Trainer Two. Do you remember that the Air Trainer Two that Supreme did a collaboration with? Oh, I'll just get up here on the picture so you guys can see Supreme Air Trainer right, Two. They tried to they tried to make it happen, but it just didn't work. I don't know. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it was at the, the time kids were interested in it. But I think it was one of my favorite sneaker collaborations that Supreme done in a while. I really liked them. Um, they came in four four colorways: white, the standard colors they always do, right? White, red, and blue. Or usually, usually it's the white, black, and red, and then the third color is like a little funky one. But I quite like the trainer. I actually had an OG pair that I uh, unfortunately sold like an idiot. But I like the shoe. It's an Air Trainer 2. Um, there's, there's a lot of story behind this that I kind of found out whilst I was reading the, the Nike Talk forums. There's a lot of like enthusiastic Air Trainer fans on there. It was fairly heavy to wear, to be honest. Not the most comfortable of shoe. Oh, yeah, Gold Box SB era. I remember that. But yeah, one of my favorite shoes. Again, it, the, the colorway in black was just insane. That looks so, so, so nice. Um, real, 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 real big fan of the shoe overall. Uh, again, severely underrated in terms of the lineup of Supreme shoes. They, so they tried it. They tried to bring this in and it didn't quite work. Again, I'm not sure because in that era, um, there was a lot of minimal or a lot of like, you know, slip-ons, a lot of really uh, vulcanized shoes, really slim silhouettes. So maybe this big clunky shoe didn't really work. But nowadays with the resurgence of DC and people steering more towards that kind of, you know, look at the look at the shoe that is a rocket design for Under Armour, right? That was inspired by the, the Osiris, right? The you know, like people are moving more towards that kind of chunky shoe trend. There are a lot of kids. I wouldn't put say people are moving towards it, but there is um, there is a market for it. Because when I go to a skate when I, when I go to the skate park in Bethnal Green, uh, in Milan, sorry, most of the kids there are still wearing cons, you know, um, and stuff like that. So those shoes are still reign supreme for the most part. But I mean, just to see if this will work, um, bringing back this Air Trainer One and then like um, SB family again. It's, it's with Polar, so it's with like a, a reputable brand somebody that has a lot of um weight in the industry so might, that might go some way and maybe again the kids might think oh this is a good way to get involved 
uh, get this kind of trend back in tune. Maybe we might see an actual video of some, you know, cool New York guys skating in the shoe that might kind of bring it back to life. But I'm not too sure if it's going to work. But again, I like it as an overall. And if you want a gum sole, you know me. I, I'm, I'm a fucking, you know, I'm a fiend for gum sole shoes. So that's amazing. I like the paneling on it. I like the fact that it's got a lot of suede um, on new buck. It seems like on the toe box. So, of course, if you skate these, they'll fade out quite nicely. Get some nice marks all over them. Um, again, the colors relate back to Polo overall. It's probably a great collaboration to come out. When you when you restart your brand, this is quite a cool thing to come out. A really cool look. They've allowed him to change the the font name on the front of the toe box there. So you can put his brand there. So instead of Nike, I think it's Air. Is it Nike Air? They've got the Polo right here on the front. And the strap, actually. Um, Eric Costa's actually got another picture that shows the original. What does it say on the front there? It says Nike. Yes, yeah, so they're able to change that into Polo. So yeah, we should see how that works. If it's going to work with the Trader One, maybe it will. This they always do this, right? Nike they always introduce, they always reintroduce a retro. Usually, if you have a collaboration, and then they kind of iterate it out from then on. So I'm, I'm assuming we're going to see GR releases of this shoe come out later on. We're probably going to see a core because they, they, I think for each model they have a black and white version and a white and black version, right? I'm pretty sure, right? For the Dunk, Dunk Mid, Dunk High, for the um, what's that called? What's that one? That's, what's that kind of boat shoe one? No, I think most shoes. I think anyway. I think I'm pretty sure most Nike SB shoes or all the ranges have a core black and white gum sole version that kind of you know they kind of sell year in year out basically to most um, general skate shops out there. But again, yes, yeah, meant to come out. It meant to come out. No date of it coming. Oh, actually, there is a date. June tenth. It's meant to come out on June tenth. Um, Eric Costin here debuting it. The Polar Air Trainer One. Let's see if that works out for them. Um, da, 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 da. What, what else I wanted to talk about here? Let's get the list of my stuff before I forget anything. Oh, Eric Brunetti. Cool. So, Eric Brunetti had some very choice words to say about one Virgil Abloh. And you know um, from watching some of my videos that we are the number one Virgil Abloh defense squad. I think there are a lot of ills, a lot of misgivings that I could personally have that I could point towards Virgil from my time spent working uh from afar with him but i think overall he's probably done more good than bad for us as a community and for us as a scene and i think yeah again it's really difficult for the person that's first to kind of burst through that door right he's kind of been the first person to kind of break through the door and make the jump from streetwear to high luck for to like to you know to luxury streetwear to then to you know fashion and he's done it pretty well right and he's kind of along the way he's you know he hasn't abandoned his roots he's brought people through He's surrounded himself by people who are much, you know, better than him or who have more experience than him. He's plucked kids out from obscurity. He's done everything that he can to do within his power to really help people out with his quote unquote platform. And you can't, you know, you can't begrudge the guy, right? So I don't I tend not to kind of focus on the ills of him. I think in general, you know, if you're doing and you're trying to make some change, you're trying to push the culture forward you're trying to contribute something i think you 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 do deserve a, a lot more praise than people out there who are always um, naysayers and you know speaking ill of the man but of course common criticism has to come in you know you have to, to criticism you have to take criticism when it comes to this different guys in different forms right when it comes from people who are storied and have a history in the game you have to take some attention to it you have to kind of pay attention to what they're saying even though what you, they're saying you might not like there might be some credence to it. And that is why we come to Eric Brunetti from Fucked, um, the OG streetwear brand in a similar vein as a Fresh Drive, similar vein as a Stussy. They've been around from the get-go. And he kind of had a he kind of a really enlightening interview with Jen Kim magazine, um, where he kind of talks through his kind of, you know, his impact on the scene and streetwear overall. It's a fairly lengthy interview, but the, I'll concentrate on a bit that says that talks about Virgil, which is towards the bottom. Um, some really good pictures here of him in his home studio uh, talking about everything fucked concerned let's see if I can find it actually where is it da, 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 da. scroll down scroll down let's just do this find it oops uh, there we go so this is the bit that he talks about Virgil about right uh, da, 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 da. so the interview asks the following this is on Jenkins Magazine I'll link it in the show notes if you're just listening don't worry you can check out yourself um, you do, so the interview asked him, um, you don't like Virgil Abloh of, of, of off white, right? I remember seeing you post things about them on Instagram. It's not that I don't dislike him; he's probably an extremely nice person. 
I don't really respect his brand due to the fact that it's not created organically. It's sort of a fabricated based on who, on him being associated to Kanye West. If Virgil was not friends with Kanye West, would his brand have minor success? I'd argue no, absolutely not. His success is by association. It's not by hard work and it's by no means organic. Okay, so... Of course, you know, everyone's entitled to opinion. It's fine. I think he comes from it from an outsider's perspective. He's not hes not the core streetwear dude, right? He's kind of segregated himself and pulled away from the scene overall. He just puts out dope products, puts out dope imagery, and just lets his brand speak for himself for the most part. But he's known to be a little bit cranky in general anyway from the interviews I've read of his previously to stuff I used to see him post on social. I know he's kind of a, a very abrasive kind of street in your in your face and tells you as, as it is kind of dude. So some of the things he's saying, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. But I think the criticism pointed towards Virgil here is probably a little bit off after Mark. I think when some people re uh, criticize Virgil for not being original, I think that's fair, right? I think so, there are some genuine arguments that could be put out there regarding his references and how he references and the ideas that he takes and reappropriates into his own designs. But he's also been quite forward and, and being quite honest and saying that he doesn't see it as a big issue as most people do right he knows what he's doing he's referencing stuff and he doesn't really think any ideas original all ideas are influenced by other ideas so what he's essentially doing is adding his little influence his little free what is it it's three percent a design tool right it makes a little tweak on things by three percent that's his kind of uh design premise so that's what he basically does right whether or not you agree with that or not is your choice but i think that's a valid criticism to criticize him and say that he's only successful because of Kanye is also, I think it's not valid. Because I think in the beginning when he was first getting his, you know, I think when, when it first came to, when it first, when it was first known that he was Kanye's creative director, when I don't think we were that aware prior what creative director did or what, who they, or what their position they played. But when he started to rise in prominence, he started to become a bit, you know, had to gain in notoriety and he started to do his own projects and started to have his own interviews and, was doing his own thing, whether it was prior to Bintrill or the Pirate Vision stuff. I think that was a fair criticism then, right? Because there was there wasn't enough time period in between for you to make an, any other judgment. But I think now enough time has elapsed, right? He probably hasn't worked directly or has sat alongside or earned a living or was paid a salary by Kanye for a while now, right? It might be five plus years or maybe longer since he's kind of done that. He's steered his own path. He's taken his brand to a level I didn't think he'd be able to go to, especially if you remember the first debut of White Show. It was fairly haphazard. It didn't look that great. It looked very amateurish. But so far, he's been able to kind of surpass anyone else's expectations by really, really ramping up his learned, his knowledge curve. And he's really um, essentially been able to grow his brand exponentially in the space of five years to what our brand should be maybe in 10 years, right? He's really grown it in the crazy sense of the word. And I think... Enough time has elapsed between Pyrex and Bintrill and all that stuff and the Kanye Association to now that you can't say he's there solely on Kanye's um, association. If anything, the Kanye Association might be a bit of an X, a bit might be might do the opposite for him, right? Because Kanye's reputation in fashion or the way he's viewed in fashion isn't as favorable as some people would like it to be, right? Fashion in general is quite, you know, clicky. Um, they're a bit nasty when it comes to people coming out from the outside anyway. So it wouldn't surprise me a lot of people didn't actually have a lot of time for Kanye. And by default, didn't have a lot of time for Virgil too. But I think over time with his success and his, you know, obvious clout, people have now, you know, I've, I've seen it myself because I I know what those conversations were like when I was trying to book um, teachers or book lecturers or book brands to kind of sit alongside Virgil or have their name associated with him. I know how fucked, I know how... Uh, disrespectful they were to him or what they said or their reluctance to be associated with him and now those very same people are now doubling back and trying to pretend make believe that they were best friends right so that is i don't think that was the case because if anything he would have done the opposite um so i don't think that's a real real uh marquee on the thing it is did his association with Kanye West play some role in his success yes that's that's obvious right i think with i think there was a report i mentioned here on this show actually um, I think they were analyzing the art world and they said one of the main predictors of succeeding in the contemporary art world is your network, of course, which makes complete sense because, you know, the contemporary art world is maybe quite similar to brands, right? There's not that many galleries, right? Or there's not many galleries of real big influence, right? That can really sway or dictate the flow or the trends or what's going on in the scene. So once you're represented by those kind of galleries and you've got that coastline, you're basically set, right? Or your network, right? Who you surround yourself with, what parties are you in, 
who you sat next to. We all know those, you know, those famous pictures we see online of pictures of people that used to be at Studio 54, and it's like Michael Jackson, it's like uh, Grace Jones, it's, I don't know, some rather random person, right? There's those amazing pictures that we see, we're like, shit, it's amazing, we'll just call people in one place, right? That's the that's the marquee of being a success, right? It's getting yourself in those rooms. You just want to be in those rooms around people because then you know you're in the right network. So that has a lot to do with your success, I'd imagine, in any field. So if, if Kanye did play a role, it was a, that stamp of like, okay, he's considered a cool guy because he's around this cool guy, around other cool guys, right? That's, that's about as far as it can go. I think clothing, a lot like comedy, a lot like most things in life, that association, that cosign can only take you so far. If your work ain't good, right? If, you, if your work's not good, you're just going to get, you know, no one's going to give a shit about it. So I think over time, I think he's proved, especially with the Nike collaboration, I think he doesn't get as much praise as he should do. I think I met, I think I heard him speak about it in interviews all well once that the Nike collaboration was a risky move from Virgil, right? Because it came quite soon in his, into his career. He was given a monumental project of designing 10 sneakers, right? Which is a crazy amount of sneakers to kind of design, even if you're just changing the fucking color. There's a lot of shoes to kind of get through. Um, it, Anyone that's ummed and ahed about making one design on Nike ID will know how daunting of a task it must be to design 10 different silhouettes, right? Um, crazy. And it was a bit of a risky decision because if that would have went wrong, especially knowing how, you know, um, knowing how uh, vocal of their displeasure sneakerheads are and people in the scene, street where people are in general, if that wouldn't have worked out, people would have crucified him. But I think the fact that he aced it out of the park, he, you know, Abducted some really cool color in some of the shoes. The the design element of it really helped. But again, that was a really really risky move, and that again can't be a Kanye thing because Kanye is a bit you know he's a competitor, right? With his easy thing, and he kind of you know publicly shamed Nike because of their reluctance to give him a contract, right? So there's loads of things that were really in his favor being associated with Kanye. So I don't really think that's true. But let's continue on. Um, what else does Eric Prudenti say here? He says, um, what are the things that newer skate or streetwear brands do wrong? He says, a lot of these streetwear brands, and when I say a lot, I mean like five or six, they immediately start putting out their heads out of their asses of these fashion houses. They're looking for clout. I'm looking at them shrink thinking, your brand has been around for two years, free max, and you're already trying to collaborate with some major fashion house. To me, that seems absurd. It's not paying. It's not the paying the dues thing. They just don't, they just don't have the eye visually. They don't understand it well enough. The reason I think it's a bad idea for a younger brand to collaborate with a larger brand, and I'm talking about the Margellas, Prada or Gucci, it's difficult to work with a brand like that if your company is new. You're setting a bar really high for yourself. So after that collab happens, there's nowhere to go but down, basically. That's where these brands lose their perspective. They lose their direction, and then that's when you start to see them do weird, crazy shit and make bad decisions. This is very, very true, right? And again, something that's always kind of perplexed me, because I remember when I was younger, again, it's always, you don't have context, right? You don't really understand things a lot when I was young, because I, I did, I thought I understood everything. I thought I was a fucking expert of all experts. I thought I got straight with that normal person, I got straight away. I was on the forums, I was posting stuff, I was buying all the new stuff, everyone knew my name, blah, blah, blah. But I was an absolute idiot, right? And I used to wonder back then when I was an idiot, or, you know, when I was less of, or when I was more of an idiot, I used to always wonder, why is it when I was reading some interviews with some brand owners that say, oh, we had offer to do such and such collaboration, but we declined it, right? And we did this one instead, or we concentrated on that. I used to wonder, like, why wouldn't you take that collaboration? That's stupid, man. You're leaving money on the table. It's a good opportunity to do, to, you know, move into new uh, product spaces, blah, 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 blah. I never understood it. Then when I started to get more involved in the street, where I started to dive in a bit deeper in the history of stuff, I started to look at people like Hiroshi Fujiwara, right? The epitome of like, you know, um, really, really cultivating value behind his brand and behind his name. And most of that's been done because of the picky nature of which of, of how he chooses his product, right? His project, sorry. He's very picky in the projects he chooses. He's very picky about the things that he backs. Um, he's um, He doesn't talk too often. Just a very precise way of doing things, very calculated in everything that he does, right? But also, all the brand's uh, collaborations that he does make sense, right? They all kind of marry up to his lifestyle, whether it's Burton, whether it's Louis Vuitton, whether it's Goyard, whether it's um, Head Porter Plus, whether it's Double Taps, whether it's Louis Vuitton. They all match to his overall lifestyle and the things that kind of, kind of form he's going for. You know, the, the point is life that he's in at the moment, right? Now he's in some ultra, ultra rich dad shit, right? So you're not going to see any of the low ball kind of collaborations he was doing back in the day because everything now is going to function as an extension of his lifestyle. And I guess what I also liked about him was that he wasn't, you know, 
begging or going after the fashion clout. And I think that's something that's been upsetting to, with more brands that you've noticed, right? Oh, especially over time, like, you know, the use of fashion models and their shoots and stuff and, you know, cozying up to fashion designers and um, wanting to be part of that whole conglomerate, which I get. I understand from if you're a streetwear dude. I've been to enough streetwear events, whether in galleries or store launches, to know that, you know, once, you, once you've done one store launch, once you've done one capsule collection launch thing with free booze, you've done them all, right? Surrounded by the same dollars all the time. It's not exciting. It's not fun. So to suddenly get these fashion houses knocking at your door, asking you to do a collaboration for a T-shirt, meeting all these new people who have a new and fresh interest in your brand because they've never seen that kind of business business model before. Like, oh my God, wow, you just, you make the products, then you announce it and you ship it straight away? Fuck, you know, that's awesome. You'd have to wait six months to get an item you saw six months ago? No. Do you know what I mean? Like, they were so shocked by that kind of thing. But that's cool. But I think the piling up to the fashion brands, again, I've agreed with Eric Brunetti, especially for an early brand, that's never made sense to me. I think nowadays, most brands do it because of brand visibility. You want to get yourself associated with the brand you also want to gain, uh, expand your reach but like you said i think that it does more harm than good because you can't you know if you go and collaborate with the margella you can't then go and collaborate with champion right it just doesn't make sense right um you can't then go and collaborate with Fila. you can't then collaborate with some random iphone case maker right it doesn't it wouldn't feel the same and your brand wouldn't necessarily get it so sometimes saying no to that really look to opportunity especially in the beginning is probably the best thing to do especially because most of these people that work these companies stay there for life. They don't usually move on. It's gonna, it's gonna. If if if, if anything, it's going to increase your. It's gonna, it's going to increase your demand. People are gonna want to know who you are. Who's this dude that said no with these screen printed t shirts? Right? They want, they're gonna want to get you again in five years, in ten years, and then by that time you'll be more than ready. You'd have, you'd be a lot more comfortable in your position. You have your feet under the table. You know what I mean? That would make more sense. I think so. Um, again, I'm not too sure about if that's right or not, but I think in general, if you're a younger brand, you probably would do you a big favor to kind of just steer off the collaborations, uh, especially in the beginning, and really kind of cultivate your own vision. I think that's really important too. If I had a brand, I think that's what I would do, right? You kind of stir away from the collaboration, especially in the beginning, and just, you know, you might, you, there might be some projects you might do with in collaboration with other institutions or whatever it may be, but not brand collaboration to get yourself out there more, or maybe with some friends, that might make sense, but. The idea of going and chasing down Bape, Supreme, and Stushi to do a collaboration with you is not probably the best idea ever, I would say. Um, but again, what do I know? Uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then I think it continues here. It's a good little bit here. It says, wait, what continues here? It's, uh, everybody, the interview asks, how does a brand know when to make that leap? When is a brand ready? I don't know. Um, but I know that all the big fashion houses like YSL and Gucci are looking at streetwear. Big fashion brands have always looked at skateboarding and streetwear. Skateboarding has been you, you, uh, vulturized by big corporations and fashion houses forever, since the 80s. These fashion houses and even now advertising agencies look at skating because it's real. Everybody likes things that are real and legit, and that's why they look at us. And skaters have a sense of community. There's a very communal and very unified. The fashion industry is not like that. Everybody's at each other's throats, and it's very dishonest. You probably remember when they when they were looking at, at, at what punk rockers were doing. They are looking at a group of people that are rebellious unified and have a sense of community they always do that which is very very true and something i've always noticed um as well especially being in streetwear having been on on both sides of the of the screen right as a consumer and as a kind of person putting out the content and being a quote-unquote brand builder um i've noticed that um fashion really does try has really in disbelief about some of the uh business models or way uh, streetwear brands go about doing things whether it comes to marketing whether it comes to brand awareness whether it comes to content they just ignore they don't understand what's going on and i think a lot of the brands especially streetwear brands owe themselves a real disservice when they kind of suck up because really the power balance is the other way around we're the ones that are in control we're the ones that are really setting the pace and dictating how retail is done how merchandising is done um uh e-commerce right um again photography advertising marketing social media we're kind of dictating that overall pace and flow and i just wish more brands would be um, cognitive or aware of that and would kind of steer the conversation more towards streetwear and less towards the fashion side of it um again just a great great little interview with everybody i really recommend, really recommend you check it out i'll scroll the top actually what's it called it's called discussing the history of fucked and the current streetwear market with everybody uh by ian mc McKenna, Ian McKenna on Jenkin Man. I'll link in the show if you guys to check out if you feel that way inclined. Uh, what else is on this list? 
da, 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 another streetwear news streetwear article in the new york times it's a really salient article actually i really enjoyed reading it this is it here for those of you guys that are tuning in um i'll read it out for those of you guys watching via youtube you can check it out now on the screen boom boom, boom. it's an article written by jonah engel bromwich it's called streetwear is not it's hot it's still hot influencer service say are not um and this article basically uh lays down the moniker regard or kind of rounds up some of the knowledge gained from the street report that hypebeast put out recently and it reads as follows a new survey of a large number of streetwear and you feel that suggests that the influence of influence the influence of influencers has been widely overstated only a, a third of those surveyed said social media influencers were the most credible figures in fashion they are more likely to impress by musicians and industry insiders which are influencers right aren't they influencers is that the same thing i guess an influencer is solely somebody that it is is an, an influencer would be someone that just dresses or wears stuff to be an influencer. They don't, they don't actually have a job, maybe, they don't, right? They're not a craft or anything, maybe, I don't know. Still, in a second survey, people who work in the streetwear industry, a majority of the rep- respondents said that they spent between a quarter and three quarters of their marketing budget on influencers. All this information comes from the Streetwear First Impact Report, which was released on Tuesday. Published by Hypebeast, the prominent fashion magazine, um, say about 40,000 people it also highlights the way that we collect um, the way that a collection of fashion and subcultures were laced together and pulled towards the mainstream Angela Back, the former band director of Supreme probably the biggest streetwear brand at the moment said that the term streetwear had a barely exist in 2010 when brands long favoured by rappers, surfers and graffiti artists and skateboarders became interested in the fashion industry prior to that it was an urban wear there was just ne- there was ju- there was just a nice way of saying these clothes are for blacks and Puerto Ricans. In the nineteen eighties, the early nineteen nineties, a certain kind of independent clothing brand began to proliferate. On the west coast, there were surf and skate brands like Sushi and Fresh Drive, and hip hop brands like X Large and Cross Colors. On the east coast, there were Triple Five Soul, Echo and Limited Supreme, amongst many others. Cool. Uh, the timing of a happy support made sense for Bark Streetwear had, he said, had reached this 10th inning. As social media created more awareness and as internet incubator rap groups like Old Future came around, streetwear started to become mainstream. And then Angela says the following, there was money to be made. There's no secret anymore. That's why for me, I think about the moment when Old Future started blowing up and it all started blowing up, which is fairly true. I think this might marry up to my disinterest with the London streetwear scene. I mentioned a few times here before how shitty some of the people were at End Clothing, not End, sorry, at Bond International, at Bape, in um, the old, uh, what's it called, Hideout Store, right? Everyone was, except for the exception of the guys from Foot Patrol, everyone was really arsy. And a lot of it might have to do with the fact that, you know, they weren't used to having so many young kids around that energy. But again, I, I, I do remember it changing quite quite drastically when Old Future put their, you know, first kind of project, couple of projects out. And I don't know if it might have been just after when, just when Goblin came out, no, Bastard Story came out, right, by um, Talon Crater. So I did see a bit of a shift in the kind of attitudes towards young kids. I did see a lot of more of those stores, especially Hideout, start hiring loads of children or loads of teenagers to kind of give them the cachet that they're a cool young place and they're with the you know they're with the kids all that malarkey so i didn't recognize that change so that might be something that he's speaking on and it continues in the early 90s we were all rooted in some sort of subculture said that everybody else, the designer behind the label fuck for example skating or graffiti or punk rock and and versus versus brands today they're not rooted in any subculture they just did this sort of support that no which is true right you see a lot with that psych ward brand right these kind of Instagram brands just pop up out of nowhere with like really crazy graphics um, and they only have one or two items available on their store or maybe nothing. Um, it's just very, very bizarre. I never really understood that sort of thing. But hey-ho. Um, like comic books or underground music, a 1990 streetwear habit required devotion. DJ Ross One, a leading collector of rap t-shirts, said that traveling to New York um, had been like making a pilgrimage in which the holy sites were Triple Five Souls, Canal Street, Jeans, and Fat Farm, which is very true. When I went to New York in 2009, I think it might have been right. That was a very much so a spiritual experience, man. Because again, I had I, I was so obsessed with the retail mafia, so obsessed with finding out all these little cool places that they all went to when they were um, in New York. Like you know, some of my forefathers, people I see back in the day in, in tweets and stuff. 
that was a fairly, fairly, fairly cool thing to see. Go to New York and see that for yourself. You're like, wow, right? Cool, cool, cool. Especially going to the Supreme store in, in Lafayette. You're like, fuck it. I've been dreaming about this place forever. And now, look, I'm finally in here. It's like amazing. A lot smaller than what it looks like in, in, in on the internet. But, you know, still, great experience. Um, uh, it says here, the thought of reselling, it would have been devastating to me to lose even one of those shirts because it was hard to get and won it so badly. Also, anybody who would have bought it. The internet, Ross one said, is the biggest, is the beginning and the end of any conversation about things that used to be sacred that are now not. There is no more underground culture, of course, because the internet, it does exist, but it's just not underground. I think underground culture is always is always going to exist because there's always going to be people that want to be subversive, that want to be ephemeral, that want to kind of hide in the shadows, do their own thing and take the interest you know, behind closed doors. But I think for the most part, most in underground club cultures do exist. They just, they just, this time it exists online, whether it's a Facebook group, whether it's the Instagram page, they exist, they exist, they exist, they exist. I, I think so anyway, in my opinion. Uh, the report was joint effort by Hypebeast and the uh, and the waviest auditing firm, Price Waterhouse Cooper, a Dr. Axel Nish, an expert of fashion, sports, psychology, and strategy. And he said the following, Street Aid managed to create this, this desirable product for, this desirability for the product, something that the bulk of the fashion industry has increased challenges in doing doing said mr niche who co-authored who co-authored the report with enrique mendez hype senior features editor those brands uh sneaker brands have tremendous credibility within the peer group that comes out of, of the community has that community of creators and crusaders many of them people of color been lifted behind uh by a large industry interest the report defines streetwear as fashionable casual clothes which is very true. The suggestion uh, being that you know when you see it and makes room for luxury streetwear brands, including Off White, Ambush, and Vetema. Why do you put Ambush there? Does anyone wear Ambush clothing? It's an odd thing to put there, right? Ambush. Huh. There's definitely a whole appropriation conversation. There's thousands more conversations as well as to be had on the point, which is a good way of saying, I don't know, don't ask me. As a brand and as a com- company, the answer is not. Uh, to is not to inauthentically try to leap up, leap, try to tap into this movement. In my perspective, the best thing that brands can do is put people in positions of power who come from those communities. Or forget that, just have a brand as representative of the people that buy your your clothing. Man, I don't get why that's so difficult. This re really, this cultural preparation stuff and representation stuff is so stupid. It's not even about um ticking the boxes and having four black girls work in your company. No, just have the brand reflect where you live. Reflect the people that buy buy your products or use your services. That's all people ask for, really, right? It's like a bunch of fat girls turning up to a fitness expo, right, to get all all bro- all brownies from their favorite YouTuber. You probably be a bit concerned if you saw them standing there with a table full of girls that are incredibly obese. That's probably not the good look. You want your fans to really, 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 really mirror what who you are as a person. I think so, in my opinion. Um, and he continues, he says, there's some, there's definitely a whole appropriation coming. No, I read that already. Uh, 40% of North America and Europe representatives said that the community had had been key to their interest in streetwear. Of course, that's very, very true. Um, only 12% of Asian respondents said the same, which is true, which is, makes a lot of sense, right? Um, you get the feeling that a lot of the Asian um, buyers of streetwear tend to just buy it because they like expensive clothing or they just like to buy stuff. They don't necessarily have that community aspect of it as well, which is interesting because they have a lot of big accounts in um, or big stores in China that sell a lot of a lot of streetwear, right? They they fucking make a lot of money. <gasps> Some of the big releases, they always have massive queues that go around the block, especially when clock drop stuff. So you'd imagine it would be a community because my time in streetwear, um, the, the some of the best times have been like queuing up, right? Uh, outside of a store, waiting for something to release, right? Start, uh, meeting new people, meeting old people, right? That used to be my the, the best time. I fucking loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. So again, um, I'm not too sure why that is and why some people don't want the community. But again, that, that, that to me was the best part. That, that's where you, you built some real friendships, man. You made some friends for life. Um, it was really good experience being those kind of queues. I really kind of missed that side of streetwear, really. Um, again, now it's probably not as fun because most people out in the queues are just there to make money on reselling and stuff, which is fine. Again, because if you want to be entrepreneur, Gary Vee type style thing, just flip items and you might find your tribe there. But I think the overall vibe of chilling out and maybe, you know, going for the McDonald's breakfast run and people holding your place in the line, it's just ugh, some of the best times I've had ever, man. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, ba 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 
the sadness of it of of, of it today, as it continues, Mr. Brunetti says, goes against what it originally stood for. It's very similar to punk or early hip hop. It was a retaliation or a rebellion. Now it's become the opposite of rebellion. It's become corporate, sanitized, and passionate, which is true. I think some brands have become that. I think I don't begrudge them though. I think if you're a brand that's been around ten plus years. You've come through the ebbs and flows. You've gone through financial turmoil. You've had inner beefs. You've had industry beef. You've had customers that hate you. Customers abandon you. I think you're well within your rights to go for the standardized, pasteurized, corporate way of approaching business and really just cash out and live your life in relative luxury and peace. If ever any of you guys have been to streetwear trade shows, you only have to you only have to buy one of these brand owner guys a drink to realize how miserable an experience it is to be at a trade show. Right, especially trade shows that are just about the look and not about doing business. Right, you spend a lot of money flying there, flying your products there, um, booking supposed interviews or booking supposed appointments with brands and buyers, only to be told that you should be make this a different color. We don't want that. We want this. We want this. We don't want that. It must be so frustrating, right? And again, just the kindness of the industry in general. Um, so again, if you're ten years in and you're thinking, you know what, I just want to cash in and start making, you know, all my clothing have words on them and shit and bright colors and stuff and tracks suits and stuff that can match sneakers and stuff i don't blame you honestly don't honestly don't man like the streetwear business is a brutal business a lot of money to be made but it's fucking cut for us fuck um mr mendez insisted that corporate buy-in did not in itself hurt the brand's authenticity as an example he pointed to wall streetwear in 2017 supreme accepted the carlisle group in a private equity firm as an investor supreme is doing well mr mendez said they haven't lost any hype Mr. Buck and Jock Ross One agree that Supreme continued to make great clothing, but each said that the brand's clientele had changed. Ross One was blunt about the shift. You can't be mad at Supreme. I still like their look at their clothes and think, wow, this is really cool, he said. The thing that's not cool is the kids that are wearing it, which is essentially the main problem with streetwear. That's been a problem with streetwear from the very beginning, right? It's it's not really about the it's not really about the majority it's just about the minority of people who look like absolute weapons wearing some of the stuff that they wear right that's always been the issue that some people have had with it even with the term hype beast not necessarily bad to be a hype beast if you want to be that but you know going out and wearing head to toe you know supreme louis vuitton collaborations with really expensive trainers and really expensive glasses just like it's just so much cringe um and supreme had to kind of weather that and i think they've done probably the best right i think supreme fans are probably it's interesting because the hundreds got some, maybe the hundreds have failed because their, their clothing got a bit crap right towards the end or maybe had that bit of a flow where the clothing was really, really bad. But maybe in comparison to what was out of the market, I don't know. I guess hundreds had the problem where people hated it. People outside, people that weren't hundreds fans hated the hundreds mostly because of the people that bought the hundreds, right? Or who were associated with them, right? It's the kids that used to see queuing up outside of their store, you know, Filipino kids, um, who like to dance and stuff, and you know, I don't know. <sighs> Maybe that was it. Was that the was that the reason why? I don't know. I wonder why Supreme's been able to not be hurt by their fans being dorks, and the hundreds was. But I guess because the products aren't as good, right? Le the level of product kind of um, is a bit different when it comes to the hundreds. The hundreds product just couldn't it couldn't compete with the level of product uh, quality that Supreme were putting out over the a few years and so. Maybe that might be the reason, but. Regardless, it's a really good article. I recommend you check it out. It really speaks to a lot of the stuff that I've been thinking over the years and a lot of the people at Shreve have been thinking too. Um, really good article by um, New York Times. I'll link it again in the show notes. It's called Streetwear is Still Hot. Influencers are not, which I don't actually agree with. I think influencers are still quite relevant. I think you know, we're always going to be influenced by people, right? People of certain credibility level or certain experience level or certain expertise will inform some of our choices i think that's why people watch you know tech review channels and whatever maybe right you want to be influenced you want to go to somebody who you trust their opinion and see what they think of the item and then you make your own rational decision about it i think maybe the idea of just being an influencer and not having any skin in the game that might die out soon rather than not right the idea just like you just review products you don't do anything else i think there might be an aspect of someone coming in and being i don't know an ex-designer at google or having had their own company that they started or being a brand builder right and then you're reviewing you know if you I've, i guess if you're an influencer if you're an influencer who was um reviewing point of sale devices it'd probably make more sense or you probably add to your level of credibility if you also had your own store so you could have some anecdotal experience that you could kind of re um, relay back into your reviews if just a kid's sitting there reviewing uh per rest devices with no shop you don't understand the demands of having a business and what you need for a pos device it'll probably diminish your level of influence i'd assume so 
So I guess the same could be said for sneaker reviewers, right? You couldn't become a sneaker head reviewer if you didn't necessarily like sneakers, just reviewing them from a purely design point of view. You need to come from it from an aspect of either having your own store, being a fan of shoes, whatever. There must be some skin in the game involved. So that might be something that we see um, changing in the near future. Kids just not kids being influencers for the sake of it might not be a thing. But the fact that, you know, I don't, again, I just think some people in media, I think people in general are probably cringed out by it or probably over the whole influencer thing and it's getting a bit annoying. I understand it. So people are trying to drive this narrative that it's, it's over, but it isn't. We know it isn't over. It's never going to be over. People are always going to, people are always going to want to be influenced. People are always going to want to be an influencer and it's going to continue. As long as social media is around, we're not going to see a death of influencers anytime soon. And now we see, you know, the next wave of influencers with micro influencers that are kind of taking over the platform as well. People with, I think like um, under 5,000 followers that people that other brands are utilizing now in order to kind of shift products, especially um, direct to actual, a captive audience, not to like, you know, we've all seen that story of that. I've actually, I'll actually mention it tomorrow. There's a story of some girl who's got 4 million followers and couldn't sell 36 t-shirts, right? And on, on paper, it sounds like a brutal story. Like, oh my God, that's horrible. But if you look at it deeply, you'll see that she isn't, she's just, a, she's the quintessential influencer, right? Uh, somebody has, gets paid or gets sent loads of product because she's a, an attractive girl, uh, fairly young, blah, 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 and just stands there and takes pictures. There's nothing, there's nothing else to her. So I guess for someone like that to then go and make products and get people invested in buying her merch, it's a big leap. You have to be quite personable. Merch usually comes from people with personable, charismatic kind of personalities. That usually works well. I think just being, you know, a bit of a dull out on the internet and point out merch is probably a recipe for disaster because there's nothing, you know, people usually buy merch because they support who you're, they're fans of you as opposed to the design, really. People don't necessarily care about the design. They know they're putting money in your pocket and allowing you to make more content for the most part. So I think that won't go away ever or anytime soon. Anyway, that's an hour so far the Exo Zinger Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a good one. Um, I'll be seeing you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show. Um, hopefully, I'll have a haircut sometime very soon because I'm looking rougher than two, I don't know, drunk guys arguing in a bar. Look, man, looks so rough right now. But anyway, I'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show. Um, for the more details regarding myself, DJ dates, contact list, and that stuff, if you have questions, um, my link to my website is down below, axelzinger.com. If you're watching via YouTube, leave me a comment and a little like. That'll go a long way, make sure people can discover it. And if you're also listening via the podcast app of your choice, leave me a five star review so people will also find out about my show. But until then, take care, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll speak to you guys again very, very soon. Bye.